I'll just go ahead and start. You guys make room for these ladies, guys. Squeeze yeah. together and give them a room on the, give them a spot on the outside. There's plenty of room in here. We used to pack like 40, 40 drunks in this room back in the day. <laughs> you guys, you can sit together too. We can still rearrange. Cool. Awesome. Well, let's start over. I'm Ryan. I'm an alcoholic and a drug addict. Um, also, I would like to start, if you guys would join me in a prayer. It's called the Set Aside Prayer. And I just, I like to say it. Um, Lord, today help me to set aside everything I think I know about you, everything I think I know about myself, everything I think I know about others, and everything I think I know about my own recovery for a new experience in myself, a new experience in my fellows, and my own recovery. Amen. Amen. I really love that prayer because it, it, uh, it reminds me I have to be humble. Um, and it says right there, I, I, I'm asking God for me to... to uh, Help me to set aside and forget everything I think I know about my own recovery. You know what I mean? That says a lot to me. Um, and it, and it, if it says anything to me, it, it reminds me that, that letting go of anything and everything, like constantly, all the time, is the way to live my life today. Um, because my past is filled with me trying to run the show, run everybody around me run the situations around me. Um, and that absolutely didn't work. It absolutely didn't work. I, I had a long, uh, long series of, of runs of, of um, getting arrested, or getting too drunk or high, getting arrested, going to treatment, or get, I guess going to jail in between getting arrested and treatment, getting out, living in a halfway house. The same thing, three or four times over the last 20 years. And uh, that was because I thought I knew something about myself and my own recovery. And uh, today I rely on what God guides me to know about myself and about others and, and my recovery. Um, but anyway, I didn't really mean to start out like that. But <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I guess I'm here to share my experience, strength, and hope, um, what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. Um, I just shared a little bit about what it was like, um, but I was, you know, I was born, I think in Norfolk, Nebraska, it may have been West Point, I don't know. Um, my family is awesome, I, I, I couldn't have asked for more loving, generous parents, I, I just couldn't, you know. Uh, but the one thing I would like to mention is, you know, I, I think it's pretty typical in a lot of families, you know, my dad was... He's a real gentle, soft-spoken man, but he was a hard ass. You know what I mean? He had dis he had discipline and, and and morals and rules and laws that he lived by. And uh, but I had a mother who was who was also gentle, but and free and loving and all that also. But she was a little more lenient on the rules. You know what I mean? She would, you know, of course I would I could manipulate my mom because I knew I could get what I wanted from her. Uh, even if Dad said no, I knew. I could ask mom and she would say yes and she wouldn't tell dad, you know what I mean? So I mean, I learned at a real early age that manipulation works for what I want to do, you know? Um, and, and that set off a long line of, of trying to live like that. Um, so even in, all, all through grade school, you know, I would do things, uh, I guess, you know, besides a, an alcoholic and a drug addict, you know, I'm a vandal, I'm a thief, I'm a fire starter. Uh, you know, I've, I've, I've done burglaries, I've, you know, as a young kid, you know. Um, all those disreputable things, as Larry says down at 303, you know. And that was before I even ever knew what alcohol was or what drugs were, you know. There was this une uneasiness inside of me. I, you know, I had a lot of physical energy and, and, and a lot of ways to, to get that out, you know, as a kid in the 90s or the... <laughs> as a kid in the 90s. Yeah, right. I wish. 
as a kid in the, uh, the late 70s and in, in the 1980s, you know, I'd take off on my bike in the mornings and, and wouldn't come home until, until dark, you know. And in between there, that's when all those other things happened, you know. I would, I would lie, cheat, and steal in everything I did, you know. Except for sports, you know, I got into like Little League Baseball and things like that. And I really enjoyed that because it gave me, gave me a focus point for that energy. Whether the energy was good or bad, you know, I was athletic enough to be good at those things. And I got some praise doing it, so I really liked that stuff, you know. But if I wasn't in something organized, if I was off by myself, or maybe with another friend with similar ideas about things, you know, like I said, we would start fires, we would, we would spray paint walls, we would break windows, we would, you know, start fires, you know. <laughs> Um, so yeah, and, and that, the, that part of my history tells me that, that I was born with this disease. I actually, I, I believe that 100%. Um, the drinking and the using of drugs is, is a symptom of my disease called alcoholism and drug addiction. Um, I don't, like I said, I, I, was, I, was, I was born with this. I, I really believe that. My behaviors as a young person were, were very alcoholic, very, you know. I just wanted what I wanted all the time, and I wanted it now. And I always wanted, I was always looking for the shortest way to get there for whatever I wanted, from, for ever since I can remember. Because I thought that that's how you did things in life, you know. I thought that's how you did things, but but you know what? The funny thing about it is, I had I had my father right next to me there, showing me exactly how to be, exactly how to be. You know, um, every day, every day, very consistent, home, doing things with me, taking me places, and I hated all of it. You know what I mean? I, most you know people say that as kids, you know, they they wish they had the love of their father and stuff like that, which I, which is very true. Um, but me as a kid, I had it and didn't want it, you know, because I'm an alcoholic. I, I truly believe that today. Um, you know, there's probably a thousand other psychobabble things you could call that. But for me, in my recovery, it's alcoholism and it's addiction, you know. Um, but anyway, by the time I took my first drink of alcohol, I chugged it as fast as I could, you know. <coughs> and I, and I, don't, I have no idea how I knew how to do that, but all I know is I think I was, you know, a young teenager, and I had probably heard that, you know, drinking alcohol gives you a buzz or gets you drunk or whatever. So the first opportunity I, I had to do that, I, I, I chugged that first beer, like, as fast as I could, you know, like, really, like, seriously, as fast as I could. And then a couple more after that, and then I just, I don't even know, I don't know what happened after that. I, I didn't black out, but I was young, so I don't really remember the night. We used to run around my small hometown of Wisner all night long and, and just goof around, you know. Um, but that first night of drinking was really fun, you know. But it, it wasn't that big of a deal for me because I was young yet. So after that, it was, it was probably a few more years until I drank or used again. And But but once, you know, as, as a middle teenager, I guess, once I found alcohol, you know, we used to go to the street dances in Snyder and Beamer and West Point. And, I guess the first time I, I drank at one of those and was able to dance and talk to girls and have a good time with my friends and just do all those things that I always really wanted to do but couldn't because I was just all knotted up inside if I didn't have anything in me. So I mean, like, it, like everybody else says, you know, I, I thought I had found my solution. And actually, you know, alcohol is a solution for my alcoholism. It is one solution. It's one, it's one cure, not a cure, but it is one I could drink. I could go get drunk today and forget about all those things inside of me that I just talked about, because they're still there. It's still me. It's the same heart. It's my same soul today as it was back then. I still have all that inside of me. So I could choose to go drink and get rid of that stuff also. But today I choose the 12 steps and the, and the fellowships of Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous. I know this is an AA meeting, but I don't. I don't give a shit about that stuff. I believe they're both exactly the same program. Um, and I believe if, if a program has 12 steps, I belong to it. So it would be way too complicated for me to try to try to think differently about every one of those 12 step programs. Because um, like I said, even as a child, I, I have this disease 
which I could I could take the Overeaters Anonymous, I could take the Cocaine Anonymous, Meth Anonymous, you know, Al Anon, uh, all of them, all of them. I mean, I think you know, like Jack says, there's you know, like over 400 different groups that use the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, um, and I truly believe I'm a member of all of them, even though I may have never participated in the behavior of, of most of them. I'm still a member. I truly believe that. Um, because the 12 steps are 12 steps. Um, and the whole purpose of the 12 steps is, is to guide a person. Well, in simplest terms, and, I, and I'm not a religious person at all. I have a higher power today that changes, you know. I heard somebody call it Gomu the other day. I kind of like that. A God of my understanding. Gomu. I might start calling my higher power Gomu. I don't know. But uh, I forgot what I was going to say about a higher power. But anyway, my journey from the 12 steps is to put it in a nutshell I heard a speaker in Denver a few months ago say that this is kind of a, talking a little differently but he said that uh, the only job for a sponsor is to take take the sponsee's hand put it in God's hand period you know so and I, I like you know thinking about that right now that's that's all I did from doing the steps with my sponsor's help he guided me away from Satan, if you will, maybe we can make up another name about, you know, but anyway, let's call it Satan or evil, which was running my life up until about three years ago. The transition to, to, to putting my hand into God's hand. And that's all it is. That's exactly what happened to me. That's exactly what happened to me. And it sounds really simple saying it like that, but, but I tell you what, everything about my life has changed. Some things superficially may look the same, everything on the inside of me has changed and so in doing that a lot of the as we say in NA you know my 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 insides match the outsides more than they ever had in my life because even when I was drinking and using I would I would still try to I would try to do the activities I love you know I do a lot of different activities recreationally or, or whatever I'm just a curious person I like I like to try this and try that read this read that um, Drinking and using, I, I wanted to do that stuff too, but I, and I could do that for a, a little while, and then the drugs and alcohol would take over, and I and then and I'd crash and burn somewhere, and so I was I was trying to be this person out here, but I couldn't because my insides did not match my outsides, you know. And and when I was in the times that I was down and out, the weird thing about this disease is that, um, you know, when I was at my lowest points. You know, looking around wherever I was laying in a in a re in a crappy rental house, or you know, going way back, you know, I spent time in meth houses and you know, sleeping on the basement floors, just horrible places, you know. But looking around, in those times, in those places, there was something right about it because my life was hell, but my outside, looking around, it fit. The backdrop like fit what I was doing, and you know what? That's I think that's why we're able to stay that sick for so long is because. It matches. We kind of get in. We get to where we are. We start believing that's where we deserve to be, and that's it. And there's something right about that. Um, but like I said, it, it's almost worse when I would be out doing some some activities in in life that look healthy and look fun and look good, but still on the inside being being torn up and stuff like that. Um, that's that's torture there. That, that's torture. That's being a dry. That's a, that's basically the description of being a dry drunk. You know, not practicing a program of recovery. That's that's worse than laying in the gutter drunk to me. Because like I said, you know, that's kind of what I do. You know, I'm a drunk. I I like to get drunk and go just be an idiot somewhere. You know, there, there, like I said, that that matches me also. You know, we. And that leads me to think, you know, like we as alcoholics, we're kind of lucky. We're lucky because we get to live two completely opposite lives, really. You know, um, there's a point, you know. Um, I heard Wes, Wes Wingate, uh, some of you may know him from the 645 meeting. He talks about he never had the bright light, you know, spiritual awakening or whatever. But he talks about, he, you know, he woke up one day, he had enough, and he had what he calls a uh, from this point forward moment. From, from that point forward moment, he said, okay, I'm going to change. And he did, you know what I mean? And, and, and that's kind of been my experience this time around. I, I, I'd had enough 
this, you know, I'm, uh, my sobriety date is May 14th, 2016. So a little over three years now. Um, but what happened that night, what happened May 14th, or the night before or whatever, May 13th, it was my, it was my youngest son's graduation from high school party. And uh, I was trying to be sober. I had, I had reconnected with Glenn. A lot of you guys know Glenn. He was my sponsor, dear, dear friend. Uh, you know, he, that man taught me how to love and how to live, basically. Or I, he didn't teach me anything. I, I watched. Once I decided I was able to learn something, I watched him and I tried to emulate him, and that's how I really grew in life. Um, if I've grown at all, I don't know. But um, the night before I got sober, uh, it was about three in the morning, you know, and I and I call up Glenn and I'm like, man, I'm drunk, you know, so just stuff, you know, and and he and he said. Um, he said, well, you're supposed to call me. Call me before you drink, you, you idiot. And, uh, you know, call me back when you dealt with the consequences. And he just hung up on me. You know what I mean? A lot of you know Glenn. He was a pretty gentle, caring person. But he would tell you straight up if you were if you were being a dumbass, he would straight up tell you with a smile on his face. And you could just not get mad at him. And it was more like with Glenn, if you screwed up, and you told him about it, you, you, like, your heart broke because you knew he was sad, too, a little bit. You know what I mean? That was, you know, I don't know. There's something about being a, a gentle, powerful leader. You know what I mean? Um, but anyway, I got off the subject. I don't even know what. I just found out I was, I, I knew I, I've been known, I've known I was going to do this for a few months now. But I went to pick up Sean and just realized that it's tonight. So I, I have nothing prepared, and I, I think that's that's the only way to really do this. That's the way you get me. That's the way you get God and me, I guess. Um, but I, I do apologize if, if there's no real timeline and nothing really makes sense. I, I'm just I'm just gonna skip around and, and try to tell my story a little bit. Um, so I was talking about Glenn. and as we all know, you know, Glenn recently passed away. Some of you may not. Some of you newer people don't may not have never met Glenn. And I'm, I'm learning real quickly that it, it, it's really cool to tell people that didn't know Glenn about Glenn. You know, it's a real beautiful thing. It's a real beautiful thing. And, and you know, and that's, that's and, I'm, and I'm learning that death, you know, death is absolutely part of life. And, and uh, I believe the physical body is, is only a vehicle for our soul. A temporary vehicle for our soul, and after it's done with this vehicle, it moves on somewhere else. You know what I mean? Um, but and, and also, you know, if I if I get away from anything that in the big book or recovery, I apologize, and you can take it or leave it. You know what I mean? You really can. Um, my journey in in AA and NA is is real. It's a real combination of a lot of different things. I mean, to name a few: Eckhart Tolle. Meister Eckhart, who was a theologian in the 1200s, St. Francis, the teachings of St. Francis, uh, Caesar Milan, the dog trainer. I mean, these are all real heroes of mine. But and, and if you, I listen to those, and I read their books and listen to their books, and it, but at the core of all of those people it is right here in, in this book. And what changed for me is I, I've always been curious about all that stuff and listened and learned all that stuff. But until I got into this book went through this book with my sponsor, then went back to all those spiritual things. Man, it's like I, I literally, nothing makes more sense now, but something changed in me. And I believe it is the, the spiritual awakening that it talks about in Appendix 2 back here on page 567. Um, it's titled Spiritual Experience. I'm just going to read this quick. So the terms spiritual experience and spiritual awakening are used many times in this book, which upon careful reading shows that the personality change sufficient to bring about recovery from alcoholism has manifested itself among us in many different forms. In mine, I know the very point that mine happened, I was riding my bicycle through Tahajuka Park into the sun, widespread panic was playing on, on, on my headphones, and I was by the softball fields, and the next thing I remember, I was about two miles down the cowboy trail. I mean, it was literally a blackout, white flashes of light. And Bill talks about it in the book here. The, the wind was literally blowing through me. His, his experience in this book 
is all, I can relate almost exactly to his spiritual awakening that he describes in this book. Um, the breeze, he says, the breeze felt like it was straight from the mountaintop and it blew through him, not on him. And I get chills when I think about that because that's exactly what happened to me. Um, but it says, you know, it says it does come in many different forms. Um, yet it is true that our first printing gave many readers the impression that these personality changes or religious experiences must be in the nature of sudden and spectacular upheavals. Happily for everyone, this conclusion is erroneous. That means not everybody's going to have experience like I did or, or Bill in this book. Uh, it comes quickly, sometimes slowly. But it all, and he says it always happens if you're willing to do this work. Always. You know what I mean? That's not sometimes. That means always. So I, I, I've learned how to trust what's in this book. I've learned how to trust the people that know this book. Um, because, because that is what's given me the life that I had today, where my insides feel like they match my outsides most of the time. Um, but nobody's perfect, obviously. We're all, we're all human. And like it says, you know, in the book, you know, progress, not perfection, but uh, perfection is definitely my goal all the time. But I feel like if I have a goal of, of perfection, then there's going to be some progress in there, hopefully. Um, but anyway, the spiritual experience, I, I, can, uh, I can wrap my head around that today. Um, and it's, it talked about uh, religious experiences in here. Um, my experience in the park that day had absolutely nothing to do with the religion. It, and that's not a knock on religion. It's just... It's my truth. It had absolutely nothing to do with religion. I haven't been to church in a long time. But now, these days also, it does say in here also that we're, we're supposed to, uh, we need to be quick to see where religious people are right. And I believe that 100% today too because I grew up in a Lutheran church in Wisner. And um, those are the, the most beautiful people I've ever met in my life. It's basically my parents' circle of friends. The absolutely the most beautiful, spiritual, understanding, loving people I've ever met in my life. Um, most of them aren't alcoholics and drug addicts, so, so they were able to go to church, have this spiritual experience through church. You know, um, Unfortunately, though, I've got this disease of alcoholism. I, I couldn't find it there. And, and I, I, maybe some alcoholics and drunks can. From my experience, it's impossible to get, to get recovery from drugs and alcohol starting with because my problem wasn't I didn't have a religious problem you know what I mean my problem was not religion and God my problem was I, I drank and used drugs too fucking much you know what I mean that was my problem so I had to start from there and grow up from there and, and I believe also that you know there's, there's the, the ground of, of AA and NA here and then there's the ground of God and religion over here and, I, and there's all kinds of other spiritual paths out here too. And I truly believe that they all converge up here somewhere after you started from down here. But you have to know who you are and where you are to start. And I'm guessing most of us in here, we wouldn't be here if we didn't have trouble with alcohol and drugs, right? I mean, so I, I man, because I tried everything else. Like I spoke, like I talked about earlier, I tried the Buddhism, I tried the meditation, the the this, the that, the running, the biking, that didn't get me up to this point where they, all these spiritual paths converge, um, which I hope they would, because in doing that stuff, it didn't require that I looked inside and, and was truthful with myself down to the core about who I am and what I am. Only until I got into this book and the Narcotics Anonymous basic text, the flat book, the 12 by 12, only through those books I was truly able to learn who I was. And that is that I, I am an alcoholic and a drug addict, period. That's all I need to know. That's all I need to know. Like I said, you know, I, I've, I've, and I've been diagnosed depressive, anxiety, blah, 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 blah. Everything else, like all that psychotherapy stuff, that's fine. I, pro I am all that stuff too. But at the core, I'm a drug addict and alcoholic. This is what I've found works for all of that. And it says right in the book that our, uh, um, 
it says in here that if, if uh, I can't remember the quote right now, but it basically talks about how if, uh, if we work these steps, uh, we straighten out mentally and physically. Okay, once we, once we cure, not cure, but once we settle our, our spiritual malady, we, we straighten out mentally and physically. And that, that's exactly what happened to me after, from going through the steps with Glenn and then listening to Joe and Charlie. One of the first things Glenn did for me is he gave me a set of Joe and Charlie CDs. And I was driving back and forth to Wisner listening to Joe and Charlie almost every single night. And uh, the combination of seeing Glenn at meetings, talking to Glenn, doing fifth step in Glenn's car, driving to the Pierce meetings, going to the Wisner meetings, you know, we, we drive around here and go to these meetings, you know, and, and he always told me, you know, I drank and used every day. You can go to a meeting every day. Man, that's true. You know, I, I've wasted a lot of hours out there drinking and using. I can at least give one hour a day to my recovery. Um, so believe it or not, you guys are the lucky ones. You get to think about recovery all day long here, right? I mean, really, and I've been in your seat. I've lived here. I, I lived in the link about eight, eight or so years ago. Uh, went through the house, graduated, moved next door, and then relapsed. And I just wasn't ready. And you know, the, the one key thing for me today that I did differently from all those other times um, is that I, I finally asked someone to be my sponsor and to take me through the steps. And that was the turning point for me. Um, but we all have our own turning points. And we all have to get to our, our point where we're willing to go to any length to get it. I would encourage all of you, if you have your own big book, and maybe some of you do, um, I wrote on the inside here, it says, I am willing to go to any length. And then I signed it when I was ready to go to any length. If you're not ready to go to any length, still write that in your book. Just leave a line. And when you are ready, put your signature in there. Every time I open the front cover of this book, it reminds me. I'm willing to go to any length. You know, I made that promise to myself a few years ago. Um, in doing that, it's a reminder. Little things like that for me, little, little cues, little reminders. I've got the serenity prayer right above my mirror at home. You know, I see it, I see it at first thing every morning. You know what I mean? Little, you know, things like that. I, I listen to the big book and, and recovery books online at work, and I've got a sticky pad next to me, you know, and I'll hear a quote, and I'll scribble it down real quick, and stick, you know, I have hundreds of them, hundreds of them around our home, right, Stacy? I mean, there's, there's sticky tabs everywhere. everywhere, and, uh, you know, some may say that's a little, uh, what do you call it, excessive, or OCD, or whatever, but I don't know, man, it, it helps me practice my pen, my penmanship, in the age of, we don't write anymore, we just click, usually, or scroll, I like to, you know, I do, I like, I think, uh, Calligraphy is, a, is an art. I, I like calligraphy. I think that's what you call the, the art of penmanship, whatever. Um, I think that's a style of whatever. I like to be able to write well if I really want to. Um, so that, it, all, it all feeds together, though. And, then I, and I've always got these little sticky notes in my back pocket, and I'll pull them out every once in a while, and I'll read one, and I'll be like, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, constant reminders. Constant reminders. Because... Um, I need to constantly remind myself that I'm not running the show. Um, and the reason I have to constantly remind myself is that I'm constantly trying to run the show. So I've got to keep my recovery right out here. Um, I don't know if you guys know Kim down at 303. He, he's got the marble. And I don't know if you, if you guys have ever sat and talked with Kim out on the bench. I highly, highly suggest doing that with him. But it's about probably, I'd say six to eight hours into his story, he'll, he'll pull the marble out. And, and, and that's his repre representation of God. And what he did when he told me that story, when I'm thinking about recovery and living my life in the day, if I need something visually to visualize, I think of Kim's marble right out here in front of me, constantly, like guiding me. Because I do have to constantly remind myself that I don't run the show. Um, and that God does today for me. And, and all those things that you hear um, about how God's doing for me what I couldn't do for myself. Man, I, I, used, to, I used to, you know, everybody knows all those quotes. And it, I just used to think it's such bullshit. Such bullshit. Or, or at least, or at least, maybe not bullshit, but it wasn't for me. I thought it wasn't for me. All those great things you hear about being free and being spiritual and having God in your life. I, I just used to be like, There's, that's impossible. It's just 
freaking impossible. But I, I'm, I'm a living, I'm living proof today that I can tell you absolutely that it's, it's all my life is today. Uh, it's all I want my life to be today. Um, I literally, all I want to do is, is, is God's will. I, I, and, and again, I, I don't think it can, I don't think I can stress it enough that for me, that's not a religious God. I don't even know what it is. That's the only, you know, one of the few things that, that my human mind disagrees with in the 12 steps is that in step three, it says, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over the care of God as we understood Him. I tell you what, I have no understanding of God whatsoever. I have absolutely no understanding, nor do I want it. Because if I can understand God, then, then God can't help me. I, the, I, I believe that. Um, but I believe, you know, it's probably there, and it's underlined. It's the only thing, well, I guess there is, it's underlined twice in the 12 steps. So maybe, maybe it's pretty important, maybe I should look at that, but I, 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 the farthest I can get is maybe calling him Gomu, like I did tonight, and that's the first time I've done that. Um, but understanding, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think I can. I don't think I can, and, and what I'm learning in this in this recovery journey is that, like truly, like like the prayer we said beforehand, the less the less I know, the less I think about things that I know, the better. You know what I mean? So I, I'm not, and I didn't find God because God isn't lost. God is never lost, no matter what your beliefs are. We don't we don't find God. God's with us the entire time. It's the reason we're all here, we're all here, in my opinion. Um, but anyway, I guess you know maybe back to my story a little bit. Um, I hope that wasn't like preachy or anything. I don't know. If I got all these things in my head. Um, but my story, like I said, my journey from from getting too drunk or high to, to getting arrested to going to jail to to living here to back out and doing that over and over and over, man. It's just so exhausting and so uh, humbling. But I wouldn't change any of that. I wouldn't change any of it for anything today because the payoff for me today is, is helping others. Um, I try to do as much service work as I can today. I found, a, I found and like, like Jeff talked about when he spoke here a few months ago, you, get, you gotta find, find what you're good at. Find what you like to do in AA and NA. You don't, if, if you don't want to be a GSR or whatever at a meeting, you know, just if they ask you to do it, you don't want to do it. Don't don't do it if you don't want to, you know, because I I really believe that it it's not really service work if you don't want to do it. Um, now that's not saying you always need to want to do service work because nobody wants, you know, nobody's nobody's that positive or whatever. Um, but I you know I found I found a nice little niche of of um, helping others through sponsorship and and. And I, I'm able to go to the treatment center with Jack every month. And just by watching him, you know what I mean, has done incredible things for, for my sobriety today. Is that clock right? No. Okay, it's 7.10, right? Okay. I just looked up there and I was like, is it 7.30 already? No. But anyway, um, what a blessing to have that man in my life. Jack is my, Jack C is my new sponsor. That Glenn passed away, I asked Jack to be my sponsor the very next day after Glenn died. Because I, like I said, that was the turning point for me is having somebody there to help me. Now today, I mean, I consider all of you my sponsors. Also, we have a lot of sponsors in AA. I look at all you guys as my sponsor also, because we're all here doing this together as a group conscious. You know what I mean? There's a lot of energy floating around here that you can't see, but it's all of us, all of our hearts, our souls, and it's, and it's extremely positive, especially in places like this. Um, but one thing that Jack taught me, I want to ask you guys a few questions. I want to ask you guys a few questions, and if you would, just answer me honestly, verbally, if you want, shake your head if you want, whatever. Um, do you guys admit that you're powerless over alcohol and that your lives were unmanageable? Do you? Yes. Yeah, me too. Um, have you came to believe that a power greater than yourself do you believe that a power greater than yourself can restore you guys to sanity yes. I do too um, are you guys willing to make a decision to turn your will and your life over to the care of God as you understand him yes. would you guys do that with me right now cool I'm going to say the third step prayer real quickly 
All right, this is the third step prayer. It says, God, I offer myself to Thee to build with me. Say it with me if you know it. I'm going to start over. I forgot to say that. Say it with me if you know it. God, I offer myself to Thee to build with me and to do with me as Thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do Thy will. Take away my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those that would help of Thy power, Thy love, and Thy way of life. May I do Thy will always. Wow. What a, that's, man. You know, you could, every single paragraph in this book makes me say, wow. And, you know what I mean? It really does. And especially that. Especially that. You know, and it's kind of a funny thing. You know, like I, I keep saying that I'm not really religious, but, you know, prayer is, is, is an overwhelmingly large part of my life today. It's the first thing I do in the morning. It's the last thing I do at night. And it's a lot of the time I do all throughout the day. Um, it just really is. It really is. And my favorite part about that. And by the way, we, by the way, all you if you if you guys haven't if you think you haven't taken steps one, two, and three yet in this program, well, you just you all just did with me. You know what I mean? Maybe you've done it before. Well, we all just did it again together because those first three steps are actual. All they are is decisions. If you really made that decision, you guys just took one, two, and three with me. And now the work starts at four. I encourage you to go to your sponsor and say, I want to do step four and five, like now, as soon as possible. There's no reason to wait, in my opinion. Um, there's some, I've heard people say things like, you know, crazy things like, wait, wait, wait before you do these steps. But there's, there's time references in this book. And I believe after step three, it says next. And I don't know what next means to you guys, but it, it means like, now, next. So we just did step three together. Now you guys are on step four. That's from me. If you have a sponsor and he says differently, I agree with your sponsor. That, and that's the way this program works. You know what I mean? It, it's more, it's almost more about taking suggestions and following guidance than actually doing the steps is what I'm learning. But anyway, thank you guys for doing that with me just there. Um, the most interesting thing about this third step prayer in here that I believe is it says that to take away my difficulties, that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help. So that means I'm asking God here to do something for me, right? And that's kind of in step seven, you know, where you ask God to take your shortcomings. But in step three there too, we're, we're, we're asking God to take away our difficulties. You know what I mean? And, but we're only doing that. We're not doing that so our life gets better. We're not doing that so I can be happy. It says in the very next after the comma, it says that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help. So the only reason I'm asking God for me to get over my shit is so I can help you with your shit. You know what I mean? Period. That's the only thing. That's the only reason. Not, not to go make more money. Not, not so my mom doesn't cry about me anymore. Uh, those are all definitely things that happen by getting out of yourself and helping others. But the, the one reason here that we ask God to help us is so we can help others. And that's where the beauty of the program comes in. And then the next, the, the next words are some of the most beautiful words I've ever heard in my life. The first time I really listened to this, I heard Joe and Charlie reading it. At the end of it, thy power, thy love, thy way of life. What a beautiful, beautiful, it's part of a sentence, it's not even a full sentence, but when I, I first heard those words, it's, it's, like, it's like when you hear a song and you're like, what did he just say? You know, for me, it's like, wow, those are cool lyrics. And, um, that's what I thought when I first heard those words. But man, what a change in my life today from the cycle I talked about. I've lived here. I graduated here, relapsed. I went to the Anchor House, in and out of jail, you know, a handful of times over the years. Um, it's, it's a wild ride. It's a wild ride. And if you're new, just keep trying this thing. Don't ever give up on this thing. Keep coming back, like we say, and just don't ever give up because it will happen. It will happen to you if if you keep coming back. It, it just will. There's no way to come around these rooms and go to AA meetings, and you're at the very least you're gonna walk out with a smile on your face for 10 minutes after, and then when things get shitty again, you're gonna remember that 10 minutes after the meeting, and you think, oh man, I might go to a meeting again. That felt pretty good, you know. At the very minimum, that's what happens to us when we first start going to meetings, and that's what keeps us coming back. Um, the world, worldly levity, as it talks about in the book, um, is interesting to me. Um, 
You know, how can a room full of people that have had these horrible, because I've never met a group of people in my life that haven't, haven't had the tragedies, the absolute tragedies happen to them as, as people that, like us. But I'm also on the same hand, once we have the spiritual awakening, I've never seen a more joyous and free and happy group of people in my life. Now that, I mean, I, I have no idea how it works. I have no, well, it, how it works. There's a chapter right here. I guess you just read that. That's how it works. But uh, it, it's so interesting to me. And, it, and it, I'm so lucky and grateful to be part of this community and to, to be a servant for Alcoholics, Narcotics Anonymous, all the other anonymous, whatever. I, I am, a, and that's really all I am. Um, it says in step 12, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to others. So that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean, oh, I'm not good at, I'm not good at helping people, so I'm not gonna try. No, it says try. That's where the work is done in trying. You don't have to be good at, you know, we're no, none of us are professional. Some people are in this world. They're professional speakers, service workers, whatever. But it, don't ever think that you can't sponsor people, help others, or anything. Because all it says in Steps 12 is that we try to carry this message. If you're trying to carry the message, you're doing Step 12. And, and you know, I, for me today, Step 12 is probably the most important. I mean, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like saying that, but... Right now, in this moment, because I'm talking about it, it's probably the most important, right? And I, I love the word try in there. Um, none of us are ever going to do it perfect. And if you're worried about if you're worried about making someone else drink or use, we don't have that power. You, there's absolutely nothing you guys could ever say or do to anybody as a drug addict and alcoholic to make them drink or use. We are not that powerful. As you guys all know from experience, I'm sure, when I was drinking or using... It, it, I never drank or used because someone said something hurtful to me. It, it's all in my understanding of what happened, you know, and that I drank and used because I'm a drug addict and alcoholic. Um, but I, that's one thing that Glenn told me that really stuck. Because I called him one time. I was really worried. Of, I mean, a kid called me. He was suicidal, you know. He said, I, I'm going to go kill myself, and I, you know. And I was like, well, I hope you don't do that. I hope you don't drink, you know. I, what do you say in a situation like that? And and I was I was scared. I was scared shitless. You know, I was like, what if I told that kid something? That, and then Glenn told me, well, you know, there's nothing you can say or do. We don't have that power. We just don't. If he's gonna do that, right after he talks to me, that's that's not on me at all. It's just not. And it's you know, and shit like that happens around these rooms. If you stick around long enough, you're gonna you're gonna see the tragedies. You're gonna hear the tragedies. And. We all think, well, maybe I could have done this, maybe I could have done that. Yeah, maybe, but we didn't, and that, that's what matters. And on the other hand of that coin, I believe there's way more victories, there's way more triumph in this program than I've ever experienced in my life, ever. Um, in the last month, I've, I've lost my sponsor, the, the, the man that I, I just love, love dearly, loved equally as much as I love my own father, and, and I've got a great man as a father, you know, I love him dearly. And my sponsor, Glenn, passed away, you know, a month or so ago. And, and, and just this last weekend, my dear old dog of 14 years, we had to put her to sleep. You know what I mean? And it's like, it's, 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 it's the most gut-wrenching, painful things I've ever gone through in my life. But in the only way I'm able to deal with it is, 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 is going to meetings, working my steps, being around people like me, which is you. God speaks to me through you guys. I don't know. It's an honor, guys. I, I think I'm done. I think I'm done. I love all of you. Just like I said, please don't ever, ever give up on this. Keep coming back as many times as it takes. And I love you guys, and that's all I got. Thank you.